morning, um, guys, and everybody that may be listening. Um, this is uh, the Senate Ag Committee is March 16th, and um, we really, uh, we didn't, Linda and I didn't put together a schedule uh, per se because of the different changes in the time that we're starting and stopping and and we didn't we don't have any bills that we have to get out um, this week and I think you should have all received a, a copy of the bills that we are, are getting sent from the house and uh, I thought this morning uh, knowing that the time was going to be kind of short, that we could talk about um, uh, those those bills that that the house is sending us, review what a little bit about what education did with our with our universal meals bill and what natural did with with our um, what we call chicken bill, but really it's it's about compost and nutrients to the soil and and soil health and and the bills that they sent over from the house to so uh, I asked Linda to contact house members so that uh, they would kind of come in and give us a little overview of each of the five uh, house bills that they're sending us uh, and and then we need to figure out uh, which ones you know we want to do first and and like 420 is the miscellaneous bill and we would want to keep that toward the end in case there's things that fall apart that we need to straighten out and add on um, but the, um, and, you know, the raw milk issue is, um, it's a rough issue to, to deal with. Um, you know, you, we'll get, you know, all the folks in and, and the only ones that are going to support that is very few, uh, because of the health hazards that. Uh, that that can cause, but I felt that we, you know, looking it over, we ought to at least, you know, give it a, a fair shot and and try to see if if we want to do it or or not. Um, the um, use value appraisal issue is pretty straightforward issue. Um, in the animal cruelty um, part, that bill, we, you know, we need to chat about that. And then Carrie's got the pesticide, uh, pesticide um, council, the rework of that. Um, so we'll have those reporters in tomorrow on, on that. Um, the, I didn't know if you guys had had a chance to look any of those over and and uh, had an opinion on any of them or you're gonna keep that until we hear from from people and I haven't made my mind up either yet but I've been thinking about some of it um, yeah Brian thanks Larry so which one is uh, the one with um yeah. Which one is the one with uh, Carrie Jaguar? I, I see. Well, it should be the, uh, the, I would think it would be the Pesticide uh, Advisory Council uh, 434. Okay, because the, the act is called Establishing the Agricultural Innovation Board. It doesn't say anything about pesticides. Um. Linda, do you have any I think any it's comments? the transition. I think he's transitioning the pesticide okay. advisory into the innovation. That's correct. Oh. Okay. Okay. Right. 
Um, so any, uh, Chris, did, did you have a question? No. Um, so um, anything else in regards to those bills? They'll be in tomorrow uh, Tomorrow, and we'll give a run through on, on that. Um, I don't know if any of you read um, Vermont Digger today. Uh, there's, there's an article in there um, in regards to um, uh, Vermont Technical College um, selling uh, their dairy farm that was, I, it, I believe, was given to them uh, by a family in Norwich a few years back. And it, it hasn't worked out for the college. And they're thinking about selling it. And uh, the people in Norwich are, are, according to the article, are upset in regards to VTC wanting to sell that. And their concern is that that's the last operating farm in Norwich. And their concern, one other concern is that they think the only pe somebody with a lot of money will pick it up, chop it up, and that land will be growing uh, households instead of crops um, in the in the future. So I I thought it might be good uh, to get Pat Moulton on the line and have a little chat with her in regards to. Um, what you know what they're doing what they're thinking about uh, uh why you know why are they auctioning it off or selling it to the highest bidder um the way i understand what's going on there right now is um it seems like they're leasing it to a farmer and uh so it, they're it's the way it sounded to me in the article, and but they want to liquidate it and, and use the money to keep the college going, I guess. I, I, that's why we need Pat to come in or somebody to come in and find out. Uh, you would think with the amount of money that we're, we, the legislature and the people of Vermont, are pumping into the state college system to try to right the ship, as you might say, um, why they need to liquidate that property to, to um, help out. But we'll have, is that agreeable? With, do you think that's a you know, good idea? Sure. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I do. In fact, I'm, now I'm curious. So VTC owns the, the farm now. If they were to liquidate it, my question would be, do they get to keep all the money or does it go into uh, a fund for all the state colleges or the general fund or where does that money go? And uh, yeah, I, I think we definitely should, uh, should have Pat in to, uh, to talk to us about that. Well, I didn't know if it does get approved or if they do sell it, they should at least um, divide some of that up with the Senate Ag Committee members uh, to offset all the work we did when we set that up years ago. And, and um, I think that would only be fair. I mean, after all, <laughs> um, but Anthony. You want to support that idea, or do you have some other comment? No, I think we could. I would go with what you just said. Um, I, I think it's interesting, though. I, I think that this the farm that they're talking about. I think one of the things that's going on is that it doesn't have much acreage left with it, and so they're saying that to bring in a, a, to make it a dairy farm, they don't have enough room for grazing and whatnot. 
But it also makes me wonder whether in some ways, if it, I think it's, if it's, a, it, it, I could be wrong. I think it's only got four or five acres around the barn. I'm, I could be wrong on that, but there's some small number of acres. I wonder if they, they would want to use it as a showcase for how to diversify. Here's a farm that was a dairy farm. Maybe now we should talk about what, what, what would we do on those acres to diversify and make it an example of a diverse transitional effort. So that's just another part of the conversation. Yeah, they, what they did, I mean, they took 300 and some acres and sold it to the land, trust or, land trust or something. And so that land has to stay, I would expect, has to stay, I would hope, in agriculture. It's like selling your development rights on your dairy farm. And... And now what they want to do is liquidate the other acreage that's left with those really beautiful dairy barn operations. And, and I believe they have a creamery there with uh, bottling or packaging capacity. They want to liquidate that and, and it, but there's plenty of land there. If somebody farmed that farm. There's plenty of land that the land trust owns to to support the, the dairy farm. I think. I thought if, I mean, there's nothing in the article about the acreage, but I thought there was around eight, ninety or a hundred tillable acres uh, that went with that um, with that farm. Well, anyway, yeah, there, you're right. There was a bunch of acres that were taken over by the land trust. Well, I'll definitely read that article. How many? 300, 350. Cool. So, there's the land trust. so how many acres are left with the farm, Anthony? Wasn't there 378 or something like that total? Not sure. Um, The land trust might has, has the option of buying the rest of the land too. Well, I think that the big thing there, and we may want to get somebody from that group. Uh, it, does it mention any names, Anthony? It does mention some names, yes. Of the people who are trying to buy it. Yeah. Because we should... Uh, if we're going to take a few minutes to hear from Pat, we might want to hear from, you know, the chair of that land trust board or somebody uh, that's already put a ton of money into that other acreage uh, to see what, you know, their side of the whole story. Yes, I agree. If Did you get any names out of well, Linda, you could try to find a name. They are here somewhere. I just, I'm not finding them now, but they're here. There's something called the Norwich Farm Foundation, headed by six people, formed after the college tried to make the guy leave his job in 2018. Tony Gemagani, a cardiologist and foundation board member, donated $10,000. I can't pronounce his last name, but it's in the article. Um, Linda, are you, uh, so you can hear us? Yes. Maybe, uh, if you, if you look that article up, you might be able to get a name of someone from the group that, the land trust group that purchased the bulk of that land to see if they might be available, uh, Thursday as well. Okay. Yep. Um, is there um, any, uh, Chris? Well, I don't mean to cut you off. I do have a question when it's time. Oh, it, it's, it's time. Um, you were working on 
money uh, for VHCB and hoping somehow there be a connection to on-farm housing and yep. some of those discussions. And uh, uh, I gather that maybe maybe something happened there or people were feeling like we were on the something positive was occurring. So do you have any update or do you know why people are excited? <laughs> Um, yeah, they didn't take the pills. Um, the, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Gus is going to take, I mean, that's all been squared away. I wrote at least two different folks notes that saying that it was being handled. Uh, Gus is going to take part of that five million that that he retained from the 20 million uh, for other smaller issues. He's going to use part of that 5 million uh, to set up a farm labor housing uh, proposal or, or fund and that he, um, He's all in agreement with that. Uh, it seems that we did a, a study somebody did back maybe in a few years back that set up all this criteria and standards for like how many people should be in a place and, and uh, it, he's supposed to be setting this new system up to kind of follow those standards so that there won't be overcrowding and and that you know adequate heat and lights and and all that stuff so you know i haven't talked with gus uh recently in regards to that but um that's what he agreed to to do and and of course Alan was going to be leaving so i i think there was maybe a little uh catch there but i'm sure that he or some of his people are working on that and and we do have some of that money in the fast track bill that we'll be voting on later this week uh so as soon as they get that going which would be the fastest way to get it going is through him. Um, it should be, you know, rolling. Um, so I don't know. Is, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's great. That's very promising. I knew you were last. I knew you were talking to Gus about it. So this seems like uh, yeah. very, very promising. Thank you. And um, we did uh, approve. We haven't voted the bill out yet, but the fast track bill uh, has also got uh, money in there for the Eagle Systems uh, 250 for for Ryan, and it's also got um, money for the slaughter facilities so that um, Abby can or whoever is going to look after that so they can get going with their uh, grant proposals to get that going. So we as a committee have approved all three of them items uh, in approach, we, but we haven't voted the bill out yet because there's other, other issues that we're still uh, working on. I think, I think those are the three major issues that we sent down to uh, approach to deal with. Uh, I don't know if there, was there any others that, I don't think there was. Um, yeah, I, I sent a couple of emails out over the weekend in regards to the farm labor housing. Um, issue so probably probably you folks heard um, from the same folks that I heard from um, 
Yeah. Did you get guys get that email from Margaret Lagus? I think it was um, either her or Jackie Poulsen regards to uh, that study that was done a few years ago in regards to the farm labor housing and in the criteria that was all set up for that. I don't remember. It would have been at least a couple of weeks ago. Linda, do you have a copy? Uh, do you recall getting that copy? Yes. Could you make sure and send that to all the members? Just to make sure you're talking about the email from Margaret? Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. if it was from Margaret or Jackie Folsom, but it, it, it set up all the criteria that these uh, farm labor housing units uh, recommendations and things. Anthony? Okay. It came from Jackie Folsom and it came on February 27th. Thank you. So we all and should that, have it. No, that'll the, give you. I got it. It's in my email, sir. It's, it's okay. called Farm right. Labor Housing Information. Yeah. Okay. That'll kind of give you folks an idea of what, um, you know, what Gus is kind of going by and thinking about. Um, uh, Anything else? Uh, any other questions or things? Anything going on in any of the other committees that you guys sit on that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, Chris? You'll hear about the Rygate extension. I hope uh, this so. This is a wood burning plant, so it matters to us because we we care about forestry. Uh, it's tricky. They, they basically, we sub ratepayers subsidize Rygate to keep it going. They're coming to the end of their 10 year, uh, yeah. whatever from the contract uh, contract from the, uh, PUC. And so the bill was to give them another 10 years. The, the problem is that it's not smart energy policy to burn wood for electricity, just straight up. And it's a subsidy of about a million dollars a year, so $10 million. That said, the forest the implication for the forest products industry is huge. It's a great uh, offloader for low grade lumber, et cetera. So, what finance has done, and McDonald is going to uh, present the bill, I think is something I supported. It basically says you get two more years, so now three years before the, the whole deal expires. And in that time, figure out if you can put a wood pellet manufacturer on campus, you know, share the heat from the, from the wood burning, and then the electricity is sort of a byproduct. Or the, the owner has actually, you'll like this, potentially linked up with a shrimp farmer, <laughs> Vermont shrimp. Uh, so we're like, well, whatever it is, find us some solution so that you can, you know, actually make use of that heat. And then the electricity, you know, is, is sort of starts to make sense. So we basically give them two and a half years to come back with a concrete proposal. It was tricky to define exactly what success looks like because all that does at that point is lets them go to the PUC and the PUC can dictate conditions and how often they run. And that might have an impact on who they can link with. So it was a little tricky. We gave them some time. We're sympathetic to the forest wood products folks. Um, and that was about the best we could do. Uh, how was is, how is the boat? It was solid. I think once we got there, I mean, we wrangled, this is, you know, it was a tricky one, but in the end, I think it was a seven Oh support. But the, you know, the issue, the subsidy issue shouldn't even be talked about Chris. Well, we I subsidize every wind tower. We subsidize every solar power. We, I mean, hell, uh, hydropower. I mean, we're subsidizing. That's why our, our rate is at 17, 18 cents. Um, 
Hal, if, if we were concerned about cheap power, renewable power, would we have torn the Yankee plant down at four cents a kilowatt? I mean, uh, you know, that that's blowing small oh, uh, digesters. Uh, you know, we're doing 14 cents on them. So we're paying more than, you know, <laughs> we're, we're doing good on subsidies. Well, so the, the, I don't know why we wouldn't mention the subsidies. Obviously, that's a factor because nothing prevents the plant from staying open. Um, the, they will not be able to survive if they're selling market on the uh, power on the spot market. The trick is uh, in Maine and New Hampshire, these plants have not been relicensed. So um, that's why we can't get rid of our low grade wood over there. It's part of the reason, for sure. Yeah. Um, so the 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 you know, I mean, it is a real subsidy, and and you mentioned other things we're subsidizing. We're not subsidizing them to the same degree, and there are people who come forward and say this is as dirty as burning coal. It is not well, a wise use of if you're looking at how to generate electricity. You, you know, you shouldn't just be burning wood to generate electricity. Now, if you're burning wood for heat and you also get some electricity, it starts to make sense. If you're dealing with a digester that's handling, you know, other issues and creating electricity, it starts to make more sense. So we're trying to thread a needle here. Um, you can imagine it was sort of a, a situation where nobody got everything they wanted. I don't think it's a bad solution. And the owner, uh, wasn't thrilled about the tight timeline, but seemed expressed dedication to the idea of co-locating another user. Yeah. Well, that would be the smart thing to, there's some, the guy maybe that owns the pellet plant down south of Rotland a little bit might be interested. Yeah. And in we had him in, he is interested you know, he's a, he absolutely is interested. He furthermore said there's money available to do these feasibility studies. So yeah. we're very hopeful. I mean, I think that's a huge, he would take again, another 50 to 80% of the wood that Rygate's using for his own needs. It, the, the one trick is he runs his plant six days a week, 24 hours and Rygate or any of them at least take a month off for cleaning you know, in the, in basically yeah. June or July when we're not demanding a lot of electricity. And so it's not clear how that works uh, with the wood pellets, but I, we, we, Bray and I both were pushing this idea because it's sort of a, a double win. And yeah. uh, so we'll see. No, well, at least, um, at least you've got the bill still alive and moving. And last year, of course, it, got over to the house and sat there. And so hopefully, um, you know, you'll get something that maybe somebody else might want from the other body and sit on it. Um, well, the, the other thing is, you know, this is a company that owns a bunch of these in Maine, um, et cetera. And he just bought Rygate in the last year. And so I, I said, well, that's kind of weird. You know, we're in the middle of the big question of whether or not you're going to operate for 10 years. And he was very cavalier about it. He said, um, he said, it comes with a decommissioning fund. So it's sort of no big deal. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know. It was, it, th this company is, we had folks present the notion that they are maybe not great actors in, in some of their other facilities. So it was complicated. This was about the best we could do. Well, don't, don't you worry. Um, they have people that get up earlier than we get up in the morning that figures this stuff all out. So, um, but it, it was very important to, for our wood industry and for the health of our, our timber products, uh, forest, uh, because you've got to get that, get junk out of the way and, and used up so you can get to the good wood. 
and you have to have a market for that. So that's great that you at least got it out and and moving. Uh, any anything else that that any of you want to bring up? Um, because two of you gang up in one committee and all you do is screw Chris over with his election laws, right? Did they vote with you this morning, Chris? The committee threw you under the bus? Well, they we had a winning, I guess, you know, it's fine. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> but I, mean, I think there, there was, we definitely had a discussion about whether it was necessary to do at all. Mm -hmm. you know, there was definitely talk about why are we doing this? Is it just sort of like belts and suspenders? Does it really matter? Because I don't think anybody thinks that corruption exists, but it could have been worse. Well, I don't know what you heard in committee, but in Troy, Vermont, I've been on the Board of Civil Authority for forever, since I was 22 years old. And, and I've been running for office since I was... 21 years old and if it's if you're running for a town office and there's no opposition you're fine as a board of civil authority if you're running for the legislature no opposition you're fine to help out but if you're running for the legislature and you're a candidate you don't pick ballots and you don't count ballots uh, you you can go there and watch them count, but you have you have no uh, no part of of the election process at home here, and we've been through maybe four town clerks in my years on the board of civil authority, but. No, they won't let me count. Well, I do count occasionally because sometimes I I don't have opposition. And so, you know, quite a few years, actually, I, I helped count. But um, it's pretty, pretty big difference between picking up a little old lady's envelope and counting ballots. Um, well, like, say if you went to the nursing home and we don't have one in town, but went to Newport and where some of our elders uh, live and picked those up. I, I don't know how that would work out. I guess I would send, I would make sure that the election officials who is the town clerk would make sure and send uh, the two, one from each party out there to pick up the ballots. Well, but but anyways. Anyway, it's not about yeah. helping them vote. It's about like who can deliver the envelopes. Yeah. Whatever. It's it's just it 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 wasn't the finest policy. Uh, you know, I think it, it was sort of symbolic, I think. Well, in my case, if you know, if I went and picked them up and I knew that there was a nice old Republican. They, you know, may not make it way to Troy or vice versa. If you had a Republican picking them up and they were picking them up from a nice old Democrat, they might not make it all the way to the ballot box. So, uh, but anyways, I think under this, you could still have, you could ask your volunteers to go out and pick up ballots. I mean, that's yeah. fine. You just can't do it yourself. And people who run for local offices or state Senate offices rarely have paid staff. So. It's not really going to change much of anything, except for maybe you know, the idea is that you don't hire somebody to go pick up ballots and pay them to do it. No, just have the county party do it. Right. <laughs> we have one of our colleagues that has paid staff. Who? Huh? Who? Well, uh, I'll let you guys guess, but... Uh, I, uh... <laughs> I, I've I've never had paid. I mean, I've paid my sister's kid in high school ten bucks to go drop lit, but I've never had like real paid stuff. Well, um, anyways, uh, if there isn't anything else, um, we'll uh, we'll uh, sign off because 
Friday, um, tomorrow morning, well, this afternoon, we got to be on at quarter after 12, I believe. And uh, tomorrow morning, we'll start at nine o'clock. Sounds so good. If there's, 